Now, for anyone who goes on social media or watches the news, always talking about that person fascist, that person fascist, but I think like the word has been overused to the extent that people don't actually know the exact meaning. Even George Orwell back in, in the 1940s said that the term fascist has become the most overused word in the English language, and that was, you know, over 70 years ago. But he said that the way that people use the word fascist in, in, in the English-speaking world now, it's almost akin to kind of saying a bully. You probably could make a strong argument for that, but that's not exactly very specific. To talk about but fascism, we're going to talk about the, the root of the word, right? So it comes from the Italian uh, for, for fascist, which is um, a bundle of sticks. So the idea of fascism is this, right? If you have one stick, it's relatively easy to, to break. If you have a bundle of sticks, then it becomes like almost impossible to break, right? So the idea of fascism was that the individual is weak, but together, coming together as a nation, then they are strong and they cannot be broken, right? So that was the kind of idea of, of fascism. Fascism is defined as being anti-liberal, anti-conservative, and anti-communist. It's mainly typified with mass displays of loyalty to the, to the party. It's defined as uh, militaristic. It's defined as having a very strong leader who's kind of set to like rule like an empire uh, that goes out and conquers like lesser lesser like peoples. The whole thing is a very incredibly nationalistic, like ultra nationalistic view of itself. This is what we actually mean by fascism. Some people will say it's on the left of politics, some people say it's on the right of politics. Actually, there's many elements of it where, I, oh, for God's sake, someone's using the hot water in the house, so we're just gonna have to deal with the, the boiler making noise. Um, that's distracting. God, so why does it make so much noise? Anyway, if I talk very, very loudly, you might be able to hear me. So some, some bits of it are defined as being left wing and some are defined as being right wing. So on economics, it's actually typically seen as being somewhat left wing because rather than being like in favor of free markets um, and free trade and fascism, oftentimes is, is, is in favor of um, autarky, which is having everything being created within one's own nation. I believe it's one of the one of the famous Nazis yeah, he said that the only thing that the Third Reich should be importing would, should be oranges. Yeah, oh no, it's coffee. That's what that's what he said, that's the only thing that should be in, um, imported. So basically, everything that can be produced within the nation ought to be produced within the nation. In terms of trade, that's what, what it looks like. In terms of national economies, how a fascist state typically runs is, as we've discussed in, in our previous videos talking about, um, talk about economics, um, it's very much along corporatist lines. So businesses are allowed to run, but with, within those businesses, it's a situation where the state is in, it allows private businesses to operate but realistically, they are the final ones in charge. There is not really a notion of like the protection of private property, because at the end of the day, everything is, you know, as Mussolini said, nothing, everything within the state, nothing outside of the state. So everything is controlled by the state. If the government decides that your car making uh, factory needs to be turned into a tank making factory, then you don't really have much say on that. The government has, has, has told you what to do. So on social issues, we tend to think of it as being right-wing though. And it does fit many of the definitions for uh, conservative, yeah, um, or for being right-wing in the sense of it being reactionary. But the thing is, fascism oftentimes is actually far more than just conservative like, kind of uh, thing in terms of like keeping the status quo, if anything, Oftentimes it's a very revolutionary thing. The certain elements of it, it seeks to completely overturn the, the, the kind of new way of doing things and go back to this old way. But also adds in extra things um, from before. So it's not just harking back to the past, it wants to reshape the future in a very fundamental like way. These are some of the hallmarks of what we mean by the actual fascism. So don't think of it as a left-wing or right-wing ideology. Think of it as it has a mixture of, of both, which explains some of its broader appeal and why it crosses, like why it has like traditionally crossed over many different class lines, um, as opposed to what we might think of as other political ideologies, which tend to be more class-based. So in terms of talking about fascism as, as an ideology and when it first kind of originated, historically speaking, one could look at the um, ancient city of state of Sparta as an early example. Uh, everyone who's seen the, the film 300 will know that from the moment people were born in Sparta, uh, people would look at 
the, the, the babies and see whether there was any de uh, birth defects at all. And then they would throw them off of a cliff. Also, when the, when the young boys uh, were, were, were being raised, they'd be taken away from their mothers and, and sent out to, to, to the woods and stuff to have to fight for, for survival. And only the ones who were the toughest and, and the most able to survive would then go on to be men. And then everything in their society was drill, drill, drill towards being a soldier and that was it and women had a very subservient place in sparta like even more so uh, even more subservient than than it would have been in other uh, city states within sparta as well the king basically ran as a tyrant so you didn't have the more democratic system which you had in athens he did have some advisors and stuff but mainly the king was the one who's in charge that was obviously over 2000 years ago, but they wouldn't have really considered what we think of today as fascism. The modern idea of fascism arose from France. The, the British historian David Starkey uh, often quips that um, all bad ideas come from France and um, hmm, he might have some level of a point, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, um, that's, that's, that's open to interpretation. But I think if, looking at this political theory series, I think quite a lot of the bad ideas probably have, so he might have a point there. So in the turn of the last century, um, I, you know, the, the late 1800s, France was going through a lot of uh, political and social upheaval. Um, it just lost the war um, uh, to, to, to Prussia, which, which soon became uh, the German Empire. So it it obviously been humiliated in that war with German uh, soldiers uh, entering Paris. It was being overtaken by other um, European nations um, as, as the, like, dominant power on the continent and its sense of itself was really kind of shaken to its core with many people wanting to go back to the the time of like kind of of the monarchy and some people wanting to defend the republic and obviously some people who were revolutionaries and communists etc etc who wanted to overturn the entire Africa. So in this kind of a messed up mix basically of, of, of all these different competing factions right we had two people yeah in particular we had george uh, uh, uh george my oh, french is terrible george Va valu Va george valu Va valu whatever george valu and charles um, um uh, charles M morass you know i should have practiced the pronunciation of this before filming but anyway these two intellectuals right uh they kind of came together and started coming up with ideas for what we would describe today as, as fascism, recognizing that it's a mixture of left-wing and right-wing ideas. Moving forwards, these ideas started to spread to other places in, in Europe, in particular in Italy and Germany, which is obviously where many of the fascist ideas arose from, as well as also to Spain and Portugal. Many of these ideas really started to come to fruition around the time of the beginning of World War One and um, Yo uh, Yo bleh, Johann Plenge argued that World War I, from, from the German perspective, had to be a war against liberalism. It had to be a war against, as he called it, the ideas of 1789. So the French Revolution, the Enlightenment era, all of the, these ideas had to be completely done away with. He was in favour very much of, of the, the Kaiser in Germany, having absolute kind of like authority and crushing the liberalism and all the other um, ideologies that kind of take part in Europe at that point. He and other people like him saw the German war effort in World War I as the, the, the hopeful destruction of the liberal war, world order at that time. This is something which is not really focused on enough. Many times people talk about fascism as just a right-wing ideology and they have it as a kind of juxtaposed and like kind of opposing force uh, to counter um, communism. But these two ideas in practice had quite a lot of overlap uh, to them. And many of the, the founding fathers of fascism actually came from, from socialist um, uh, movements. World War One was also a bit of a schism within the, the kind of worldwide socialist movement uh, as we as we mentioned in previous videos because there were some people who believed that you know the work the, the works of the world have no nation state um you know workers the world unite like kind of internationalism but there was also another section that believed very firmly in nationalism right who believed very firmly in you know their nation winning that war many of the people who went off to go and fight in that war became people like um, Benito Mussolini became people like Adolf Hitler, became people like many of the other uh, very prominent people uh, within the, 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 the fledgling 
post-war um, uh, fascist movements. They argued within this that this war was, was a good chance to actually expunge these nations of any of the kind of like weakening that had, had been there by having liberalism they believed that their societies had become weak had become decadent and so this war was a, a way of reasserting uh, the kind of like the pride and the and the spirit of of their nations especially in germany um the the work the work of uh, friedrich nietzsche end up being corrupted uh, so so this idea of the ubermensch you know the, the supermen ended up being really propagated by certain elements who believe that through through this war this would be a way of creating you know the stepping stones towards that ubermensch so johann plenge yeah as we've mentioned had you know he he was the first person who coined the term of national socialism but the first time where explicitly you have something called fascist yeah was in the fascist uh, manifesto uh, by marionetti see my italian accent is a little a little bit better hopefully uh, so Marionetti, uh, he created the Fascist Manifesto and he did this in 1919. This was after the the end of the war and after the, the kind of rise of Bolshevik movements, both in, in communist Russia and across m many other places in Europe. He argued right, for many, many left-wing things, such as you know, an eight-hour day. Uh, he argued for uh, retirement at 55, um, which doesn't sound like such a bad idea, actually, retirement at 55. That's what I'm aiming for anyway. Um, and many other people, you know, um, uh, such as, you know, eventually Benito Mussolini and um, someone called D'Anzio, uh, these people started to come together and actually start to really mould this idea of fascism and really, like, have it as, like, a political platform to actually stand on rather than this kind of, these vague ideas. So now you start to see fascism turn from just uh, amalgamation of different ideas to now an actual political like movement yeah that they're actually trying to implement so this all culminated in 1922 with the famous march on rome led by mussolini mussolini wanted to you know he, he marched all the way to rome to speak to the, to the king and like demand that there be setting up of a, of a fascist government in the early years as with many of these movements yeah they don't start off immediately on, on day one by being like, right, we're going to abolish this and do this, that, that. It was very slow at first, yeah, like, it was very, like, calm. Over time, within the space of about two to three years, all of a sudden, they started becoming a lot more repressive. In a very, very short amount of time, all the freedoms that post-war Italy had had end up being completely subverted by Mussolini, and Mussolini ended up becoming El Duce which is the leader. During this time, some people um, had a lot of support for it. A lot of people kind of felt that, well, actually, in terms of all the, the turmoil that's going on at the moment, yeah, maybe, maybe democracy is not the best way. Maybe, like, as Mussolini said, maybe men are, have become tired of, of, of liberty, right? Maybe they want someone who's in charge who can just, you know, keep the trains running on time, as, as, as the old saying went, yeah, and restore a sense of national pride and a sense of uh, national order like, to, to the place. And also these ideas obviously rose in, in post-war Germany as well. Uh, you saw like the Beer Hall uh, Putsch of 1924, uh, which was uh, an attempt, obviously, to replicate the march on Rome, uh, where Hitler wanted to you know, overthrow the, the, the Weimar Republic and set up a fascist state there, although obviously he was unsuccessful at that time. Now famously, Christopher Hitchens, uh, uh, well, yeah, the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, made the point that fascist, uh, fascist parties across Europe during this time uh, were very, very linked to the Catholic Church. Now, there's elements to this which are true, in the sense that many um, prominent um, fascists, both in, in Italy and in Germany and across many other places in Europe, did have a strong belief in, in, in like the Catholic Church and stuff, whether it be Spain or uh, Slovakia or many other places ar ar around, around there too. But realistically, it was a thing of fascism at its core had a great disdain for the, for the kind of niceties that you kind of have within, you know, if you believe that kind of like Jesus, you know, is this peaceful man, you know, he's kind of, some might say, describe him as a cool, almost like a cool, like, like hippie dude, like kind of like, like, it's quite hard to have that mixed with this kind of idea of like the, the you know, 
the having a strong militaristic state, right? The two, the two kind of like ideas like really clash with each other. What we see in many uh, um, investors countries is either one or two things. Either one, they try to find some sort of common ground with the Catholic Church. They try to do little like deals and stuff like Concordia, where you kind of go, all right, cool. We won't mess with the church if you guys like stay out of politics right and they try and do some sort of things like this here right however during the 20s and 30s um, and and into the 40s you still did have many uh, prominent catholic priests and you know protestant priests etc etc and many many people like who are religiously minded who spoke up and were like were actually either arrested or murdered uh, by the, the different fascist uh, organizations it's not as easy as just saying oh well they're all catholic and also as well Benito Mussolini himself worked like was throughout his much of his life like an atheist right and even Hitler he never renounced his catholic faith but in Mein Kampf he, he, he quite clearly kind of like kind of says that he would have preferred it if Europe had had gone under Islam uh, rather than Christianity because he believed Islam to be a more warlike uh, religion whether that's right or, or wrong that was his his views on it he believed that Christianity was too soft so again kind of linking Christianity to fascism um, is something that's been done from time to time but it's not particularly accurate now as we said yeah we're not going to be able to go through all the, the in-depth of what happened in like World War Two with the rise of the Nazis and stuff because like I said that's been covered extensively but it's, it's very important to recognize that for people who want to understand what happened in World War Two uh, in Europe they have to read Mein Kampf. That sounds like, don't, that, I don't want that to be misinterpreted in terms of in, an endorsement of Mein Kampf uh, or hit the second book, um, as the Zweig book. Um, but both of those books clearly outline everything which Hitler is planning to do in World War II. Mein Kampf is written in 1924. You can clearly see what is going to happen like 20 years like, hence, right? Just from reading that book. Everyone in the 1920s or 30s who had a copy of that book could clearly see what path Hitler was going to go down and what his exact war aims were going to be. If one is a historian, if one wishes to understand and get inside the mindset of Hitler and what he was doing in World War II, one has to read Mein Kampf. This is a very, very important thing. Within Mein Kampf, Hitler talks about communism. When he critiques it, he critiques it more as he just kind of as it almost like a throwaway line in terms of internationalism, it, it doesn't make any sense because like, you know, like, like workers in different places around the world all earning different wages and etc. Then also, obviously, there's the, the strong racial element to which he like, uh, like opposes it by saying that all the different races of the world should not unite together just because they're workers. And he obviously criticises uh, communism with being uh, this judeo-bolshevik conspiracy right it's where like the jews are somehow like in charge of like this global conspiracy to spread uh, communism within Mein Kampf there is a whole chapter devoted to critiquing liberal democracy and capitalism in general there's a whole chapter devoted to actually cr critiquing everything about it critiquing the fact that um having Having many people making decisions means that the decisions become uh, a weaker. Having a free society is more decadent. He argues against liberalism far more than he argues against communism. Communism is merely just a competing ideology for the exact same type of voters. The only real difference between those who'd vote communists and those who'd vote, um, vote, who'd vote Nazi would be, you know, the certain elements of like of the, the bourgeois like middle class and stuff, right? But that was kind of it. The one group of people that neither group could really appeal to were the free-minded liberal thinkers because the, these people were not interested in authoritarian top-down regimes, yeah, that, that suppressed people's freedom and had enemy classes or enemy races, right? So liberalism, that is the real counter to both communism and fascism.